Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, our first talk of the day is by Agil Engel uh, from Microsoft Israel, who will be talking about posted price exchange for display ad contracts. Agil. Thank you. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Moshe Tenenholz. Um, when we talk about display advertising, uh, we refer to those banner ads that are shown on, uh, on web pages and more and more within apps, in what I will refer to as ads in apps. And the main feature, the main uh, power that they give advertisers is in the ability to target specific segments of the user population uh, as it is defined by a large number of criteria. For example, uh, demographic properties of the user, uh, browsing history, uh, the current content that he's watching, and, um, and um, the, the even uh, current time. For example, uh, I may target uh, a campaign to, for females from California who ski, and I want it, and I want it to be during the morning hours. Uh, or, or another campaign to males that visited a bank website and have high income. Um, so the number of criteria is very large. It, it is in the hundreds at least, uh, maybe many hundreds. Um, so the, the, um, there are two ways today to sell, two main ways to sell impressions. Impression is the, is the, is the basic good that is traded in the display, the, in the display advertising market. It is a one view of one user of one advertisement. One way is through a spot market or what's called the ad exchange. Where, uh, which takes place while the user is browsing, while the user is waiting for the page to load. So this is, of course, very fast, and uh, it is, um, it's then pretty limited in terms of the expressiveness of, um, of, uh, of advertisers' bidding. The other way is through, um, it is, is through what's called reserves or contracts, where, uh, where an, an, an advertiser and the, and the publisher sign a contract for a specific amount of impressions of, uh, for a specific segment to be delivered within a specific time frame. And this is today sold uh, in a very dispersed manner where uh, salespeople of the publishers uh, talk with the advertiser and close a deal for, for, some, uh, for some specific segments. Uh, or it can be through an intermediary uh, like Microsoft that, uh, that, that, that might take some uh, might operate some, uh, in some um, uh, dis uh, display areas for some uh, other publishers, usually large publishers. Um, in the literature, uh, so, so the focus of this work is the contracts market. It's not the spot market. This is important to note. And um, the literature about the contracts, uh, we have identified two, two, uh, two main threads. There might be more, but what one that we've identified is, um, is um, works that look at the current framework of those bilateral negotiations between uh, publisher and, and advertiser and just try to help uh, publisher to price their inventories better uh, based on some kind of demand prediction. Um, and uh, the other th uh, thread is, um, is um, uh, people propose to, uh, to run an auction where a publisher, one publisher sells a fixed usually large inventory through, uh, through, an, uh, through an auction that takes place um, um, very periodically. Um, what's missing, especially uh, what's missing in the market today to our, uh, from, 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 from our point of view is first of all, some kind of automation, the, uh, this way that, um, that uh, Publishers, salespeople uh, have to contract each individual uh, advertiser. It's kind of cumbersome, and some. Uh, and when we are moving more and more towards a world where publishers, uh, there are lots of small publishers that just uh, someone that, someone just develops an app and 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 wants to monetize it. So there are lots of publishers and lots of advertisers, and we want to achieve some kind of, of economic efficiency over this uh, global matching between publishers and advertisers. <laughs> So the approach that we take is different than the, than, uh, than, the, than the previous two. What we are proposing are posted prices, which uh, is, of course, a very traditional uh, concept, but it's kind of new with 
uh, with, this, with display advertising. And what we want to get is to prices that are market equilibrium, which is another uh, old and beloved uh, concept. So what is market e uh, equilibrium? Let's say we have a set of goods, G1 through G10, and we have uh, buyers on one side and sellers on the other side. And uh, we have prices. We have a price for each good, pi 1 through pi 10. Um, and given those prices, each, each buyer uh, maximizes his own utility function, so finds the, um, the bundle, the vector of, of, of quantities over the goods, which maximizes his utility under some budget constraint. Uh, usually the utility would be over some subset, some small subset of the goods, so the rest would, would, would uh, the quantity would just be zero. And um, on, on the other side, the sellers, uh, this differs between the, um, the specific market models. In some market models, uh, the, um, uh, the sellers have fixed inventory or what's called endowment. Uh, and in some other, they have some uh, production set that tells us what they can produce uh, given, given, uh, given prices. Um, but they also um, have, end up with some vector of quantities over the goods, which represents supply. So we can aggregate, uh, or if we, if we aggregate this supply on one side from all the sellers and, uh, and the demand on the other side from all the buyers, then uh, if, we, if, we, if one is equal to the other, then this is called a market equilibrium. And we like equilibrium because it, is, um, it provides some, we have the welfare theorem, so it provides some uh, sense of efficiency uh, over this uh, global two-sided market. Uh, and we know that, um, that the demand of each buyer is going to be satisfied. So every buyer is going to exhaust his budget. So this is some sense of revenue. If you look at the aggregate amount of money that goes into the market, it's also maximized. And it's not really that, that everybody's happy. Nobody's ever happy. But uh, it, is, um, it, it provides a sense of, of uh, stability. Nobody wants something else given, uh, given current prices. Um, so now think about the, um, uh, well, in economics, it's usually the case that we are saying that we are saying uh, we have this set of goods and the market, we have this invisible hand that will make the market reach an equilibrium at some point. Uh, what emerged in, in computer science, I think, is the idea that, um, that, that we can, that if we know, happen to know the utility functions there and the inventory is here, we can calculate those equilibrium prices, and if we control those prices, we can just set them such that it is in, in um, equilibrium. So back to the display market, think about an intermediary like Microsoft or Google that uh, runs this market and controls the, the prices. If we knew the, uh, the, those, those, uh, those utility functions and we can predict inventory of of publishers, then we can calculate equilibrium prices and, uh, and then achieve all those, all those uh, great things here. Um, so uh, this sounds to me like a nice idea, but it has some, uh, some serious challenges. First of all, uh, I mentioned hundreds of criteria and the number of Im uh, each impression is a configuration of all, the, of all the criteria. So the number of goods that we have in this market is exponential in the hundreds. Uh, so, of course, we can't maintain a price for each possible good. In addition, um, so no buyer and no seller really specifies all those hundreds of criteria. There are, each buyer cares about some set. So, for example, B1 here has uh, three campaigns. In one, he cares about C, D, and E. In the other, he cares about A. And in the third one, he cares about C and A. And those are quantities there. Uh, and B2 cares about different attributes altogether or maybe some overlap. Um, and sellers also, they, they, um, sellers can guarantee only uh, the kind of impressions that they, um, that, they, that they track through their log files. So one seller knows that he has uh, these quantities of, uh, of A and B and he doesn't know anything about the rest of the attributes and so on. So, so it turns out that each buyer and each seller uses kind of different language in this market and we somehow have to bridge that. Um, and the third challenge would be to, um, so in order to calculate um, equilibrium prices, we need to know the utility function of advertisers. Um, and uh, this is, these are utility functions over quantities of goods. And there is a large number of goods. And, and um, so for those that are familiar with the uh, expressive auctions 
terminology, we are talking about utility that is both multi-attribute and combinatorial. And similarly, in, on the supply side, this is also not easy because suppliers have log files, and we will somehow need to, uh, to translate this, uh, even assuming that the log file is a prediction of, of, uh, of supply, uh, it will be hard to translate it in, uh, into this uh, supply over our market goods. So we will deal with, uh, with the first two challenges first and then leave the, the other two for later. Um, and and this, this, this kind of summarizes our approach. Um, let's say, and forget for just one moment about, about display advertising. Let's, th let's, let's think about this market model where we have a set of market goods. Um, and we, said we, we, we have a set of different goods on the demand side, and each buyer has utility function over some subset of these demand goods. And we also have a set of supply goods, which are also different. Uh, each seller has, some, has inventory over some subset of these, of these supply goods. But what we do have is this relation, which we call satisfaction. When we connect a supply good to a market good, uh, if, the, um, if the supply good satisfies the market good. Um, and, and on the other side, it is the opposite. We, we connect a demand good to a market good if the market good satisfies the, the demand good. And this can be a many-to-many -many relation. So back to the display advertising world, if we have here a um, um, female from, from California, uh, then this is satisfied by good that is female from California who, who, who skis. And this can be another good, which is uh, someone from, from California that skis. This is also satisfied by, sorry, by the same, by the same, uh, by the same supply good. And if this is, uh, I said, uh, someone from California who skis, it is also satisfied by a different supply good, which is someone from California who skis, and this impression happens during the morning hours. And it's the same case on the other side, that we have this many-to-many -many relation. Um, so this is going to be our model. Um, but before I keep on talking about that, I have to say something about those market goods. How do we come up with them? And it's um, nothing in, this, uh, in the results requires one way, or one way or another. We could take any set of statements um, uh, like those that I mentioned and turn them into the market goods. But one way to make it uh, work probably uh, okay is by taking, um, by declaring the union of all the, um, um, so we can take all the statements, all the demand statements that we get from advertisers, take the union of them and make that the, the set of market goods. So this can be a lot of market goods, but it's still linear in the input to the market. So it's going to be a manageable number of goods. Um, so in this example, we have one advertiser that wants to advertise to high-income females and another campaign to male cyclists. And then we have a second uh, advertiser that has these three demand goods. We have separate campaign for cyclists and, second, and, and, and the third campaign that he just cares about the gender. Um, so we can take the union of all these and, make, and have these five, uh, five uh, demand goods. Um, five demand goods uh, and set them as the, as, the, as, the, as the set of market goods. But it's not, it's not necessarily, uh, but doesn't, it, uh, it doesn't have to be this way. So what do we need now? We need to first, uh, we have this awkward market model where we have uh, market goods on, uh, and we have a utility function defined over different goods. Uh, and inventory defined over different goods with this, uh, with this many to many relation, we still need, in order to show that we can even find prices over the market goods that are in equilibrium, we need to somehow reduce it into, um, into some classic market models where the utility and inventories are defined on the same goods. Um, and, uh, and, and after we do that, we also need to show that we can compute this equilibrium in, in uh, polynomial time. And, uh, to, and to do that, we will, um, I will show what's called an excess demand oracle. Uh, so excess demand is just the difference between this aggregate, supply, uh, aggregate demand on one side and aggregate supply on the other side. 
And uh, demand and supply can actually be correspondences. It doesn't have to be functions. So there can be multiple bundles that maximize the utility of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a buyer. So an excess demand oracle would have to go through all those options and find uh, the, uh, the excess demand vector that minimizes this excess demand. So uh, in a sense that its largest coordinate is, is, is minimal. So we will need this polynomial excess demand oracle. And for, for us to be able to compute equilibrium in polynomial time, we will also have to assume that utility functions exhibit what's called gross substitute. That's, uh, that's a limitation that is be known uh, to, to be required in order for, uh, for equilibrium computation to be, to be polynomial. Um, what it means is that advertisers cannot have um, uh, complementarities between different kinds of impressions. So I will never be willing to pay more for two impressions of different types, more than I, uh, the sum of what I'm willing to pay for each one separately. Um, and this might not hold because advertisers may have, may have what's called a minimum reach. So if I'm not advertising to both Michigan and Ohio, then I might as well not advertise at all. Uh, but it's probably a reasonable approximation uh, in this case. Uh, and, then we, and then we'll be able to use previous results uh, uh, that show that equilibrium under this specific classic market model that we will have, uh, that equilibrium can be computed in um, polynomial time. And then the third thing that we'll have to do is to show that we can elicit the utility functions and figure out the inventories of sellers in order for this to work. So, um, so how does the demand look like here? We have, um, le uh, let's say someone has a demand for cyclists, wants to advertise to cyclists. And now we, uh, we might have three different market goods. One is Michigan cyclists and one is high income cyclists. And maybe we even have a market good that is called cyclists. So these are market goods that have overlap between them. This is the basic problem that we have here. Um, and each one of them can satisfy that demand good. But um, we know that the, that, the, that, that the advertiser is utility maximizer. Uh, and we know the set of goods, the set of market goods that satisfy this each particular demand good. In this case, uh, G5 through G8 all satisfy this demand good. Uh, and by definition of utility maximization and assuming that the advertiser is indifferent between all the market goods that satisfy this because if I wanted uh, male cyclists rather than just cyclists, then this would have been a different demand good. So assuming that I target the campaign just, just to cyclists, I'm indifferent between all of these. So I will naturally choose the, the cheapest one or ones. So maybe there are, uh, there are a few market goods that, are, um, that have the same price, pi 6 equal, equals pi 7. Um, and then we know that the price for this advertiser of this demand good is pi 6. So this way, we can define price vector over the, over the demand goods. And we can just do utility maximization um, over, the, over, the, over the demand goods. Um, and the output of this oracle then would be, a, would be a demand vector over the demand goods. And we will also maintain this mapping back to the market goods. In this case, the mapping from this good back to the market goods would be, uh, would be G6 and G7 because these are the two uh, utility maximizing market goods. Um, so the, the, the quantity that is defined here over this demand good would be mapped to G6 and G7. Now, on, uh, this would be polynomial if the utility maximization problem is polynomial. And for the utility elicitation purposes, we'll have to make strong assumption over the utility functions. And under these assumptions, it will also be, uh, I, I, I will show that this computation is uh, polynomial. Um, on the supply side, we have a similar problem. We have uh, uh, someone has a supply statement like high income cyclist for Michigan. And there are three different market goods here, Michigan cyclist, high income cyclist, and also just cyclist. Um, and this is just an example. We could have, we might not have this market good cyclist, right? It's not, uh, it's not necessarily that we have uh, some closure here. Um, so if on the demand side, the, um, the, the definition of utility maximization 
solve this problem of choosing which, which, which market good we take, then the analogy on the supply side would be production. So it's not really the case that anyone produces anything here, but if, but if a, a supplier predicts that he will have high income cyclists for Michigan, this means we can think of it as a production problem in which he can either produce a Michigan cyclist, a high income cyclist, or, a, or just a cyclist. And because the costs are the same, it's the same impression, um, then we will just take those market goods that, um, that are satisfied by this demand good and maximize the, uh, and have a maximal price. So let's say uh, pi three and pi four, pi three equals pi four, larger than pi two and pi five. So the price of this, of this supply good would be pi three. And again, we have prices over the supply good, so we can, uh, we can uh, come up with this, uh, what we, we will call a profit maximizing production plan, even though um, it's not exactly production and we don't have any inputs. So the output of this supply vector would be, uh, of this supply oracle would be, uh, would be a supply vector over the, um, so it would be quantities over the supply goods and this mapping back to the market goods. In this case, this is mapped to G3 and G4. Um, and this would be polynomial. Uh, it, sound, it, it, it's, it sounds like it's obviously polynomial because we are not doing anything here. But the problem is that we need to have this supply in a very specific form. We need to have, if this is a set of impressions of, uh, of, uh, of Michigan cyclists and this is a set of impressions of male cyclists, this says I have 100,000 of these and 200,000 of these, the, uh, the semantics of that is that we have altogether 300,000 impressions. Otherwise, we will, um, so, so even though the statements are overlapping, each one of them refers to, so I know about 100, that, that so I have 100,000 impressions on which I know that there are cyclists from Michigan, and I have another 200,000 impressions from which I know that there, are male, that there are male cyclists, and I just don't know the state, but the set of impressions are disjoint. And this is required so we don't count the same, the same impression twice. So our challenge to make it polynomial will be to come up with this uh, disjoint uh, representation from the log files. So uh, I kind of... <laughs> did the existence and the beginning of the computation of equilibrium together because I talked about, about those demand and supply oracles. But, but this is also what's required for the existence. Uh, when, uh, what I did would uh, helps us to show that uh, we can translate the utility functions to utility function with the same properties over the market goods and we will assume that when, when, we, when, I, when, when we do a model for the utility functions, and, uh, and, it's, and it's also obvious to show that we have production set that has some good properties, and um, we can do some work in order to make it look like, or, or to reduce it to, uh, to, a, to a, classic mar a classic production economy that, that, that was proposed by Arrow and Debro, uh, and they also show that equilibrium prices always exist. So we have that existence, and now for the, um, for the computation of the equilibrium, what's left to do is to, uh, is, is, is to show that we can compute excess demand. And um, for this, we just take the output of the demand and supply oracles. Um, what we had there is we had, this, um, um, we had this demand over the, over the demand goods that, uh, that each, each demand good is mapped to several market goods between which the advertiser is indifferent. So, and similarly with the supply. So what we do here is some search over those and trying all the, all the, all the possible assignments through, through this linear program the, such that the difference between the aggregate demand and the aggregate supply is minimized. Um, and um, this would be polynomial. Of course, we still have to show that we know the, the, the utility function and that the utility maximization is polynomial, uh, like I said, and that the supply is in this convenient form. Um, so now we have previous results that show that we can, uh, that, uh, that show that, uh, that um, the uh, equilibrium prices can be computed in polynomial time, but um, 
we found it useful to also uh, provide a simple algorithm that does that because um, uh, the previous results of Codenote and others rely on the ellipsoid algorithm, which is known uh, to not always perform well in practice. And also because a simple uh, tautonement-like process would work here. Uh, this is just starting with very small, uh, very low prices, like uh, zero, for example, and then at each iteration, we, we, we just find a good that has highest excess demand and increase its price by, uh, by some delta. This is not strongly polynomial, but with this small price range, we assume, we, we think that it's going to work well in practice. Um, now, the reason it's going to converge is, first of all, the, the formal definition of gross substitute is that if we increase the price of one good, then it does not reduce the demand on another good. And uh, the second thing that we, that, that we know here is that if we increase the price of one good, it will also not increase the supply on another good, because if anything, we're going to switch the production from, from other goods towards the good whose price increased. So these together, and we also know that equilibrium prices exist, then we can show that if a price of a good exceeds its price in this, in this, in this uh, uh, equilibrium vector, then we will never have to increase uh, that same price again. So, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then the algorithm is going to converge to this uh, equilibrium. Um, so uh, this kind of finishes this, this part of, uh, of equilibrium existence and, and uh, computations but still under the assumption that we know the utility function of advertisers and we have this inventory of, um, of, uh, of suppliers. Um, so how do we elicit the utility functions from, uh, from advertisers? These are utility functions that I mentioned are multi-attribute and combinatorial. We have utility over quantities of good. So even if we, uh, if we did some kind of, uh, we, even if we know that someone is willing to pay 500 for, or uh, willing to pay X for 500,000 impressions of some type, how do we know how much is he's, he's willing to pay for 700,000 impressions, right? Um, and um, in addition, we don't want to do any bidding because it's not natural in this kind of market. We have posted prices. So all we want, all we can do is observe what the utility, what the advertisers are purchasing. We can only observe the demand vectors of advertisers under given prices. So the idea is that we have some initial prices pi, and we observe the demand vector d pi, and we somehow need to extrapolate the utility function out of it, and, uh, and now use this utility function in order to calculate the demand for any other price vector in order to be able to calculate equilibrium like we did in the, in the previous slides. Um, and it turns out that this can actually be done uh, with, we can extrapolate utility function from one observation under very strong assumptions on utility. One, um, uh, there are two examples here. One is called the Cobb-Douglas utility function. Under Cobb-Douglas, we, uh, we have fixed, we, we are dividing the budget uh, in a fixed way between different, different kinds of goods. So if we, if, we, if we have utility over two goods, um, then, and under some price vector, we will spend 60% uh, of our budget on one good and 40% on the other good, then this is going to be the case for any other price vector. So this is very firm. Um, th th there is no, uh, no uh, substitution between goods. And the other extreme is a linear utility function in which uh, we can substitute anything as long as we maximize our, our utility. So there is no notion of budget allocation between, uh, between good. And both seem too strong for this market because advertisers do substitute all the time between different kinds of goods. Uh, but on the other hand, they do have also this sense of uh, allocating, uh, allocating budget for, for, uh, for specific good. And uh, the truth is probably somewhere in between. So, so what we propose is to use a, a more general form of utility function that is called constant elasticity of substitution, uh, where we are, uh, it has this, uh, this mathematical form where rho is related to elasticity, 
when rho is, uh, is, uh, is zero at the limit, what we get is the Cobb-Douglas utility function. And when rho is one, what we get is the linear utility function. Um, and, um, it, uh, and it kind of captures this whole spectrum of constant elasticity. What constant elasticity means is that we can have any kind of elasticity, any kind of flexibility in substituting between different kinds of goods when the, when the price changes. So uh, the, the, the elasticity is a measure of how easy we will go between from one good to the other if, if uh, say, the price goes up of, the, of our original good. Um, but, but, but it has to be the same, uh, the same level of the, the same elasticity for any pair of goods at any, at any prices. So it's still a pretty strong assumption, but it's uh, much more general than the linear utility function, uh, which is uh, very popular in this literature. And the Cobb-Douglas utility function is popular in general in the economics uh, literature. Um, now, and if rho is greater than zero, it also captures the gross substitute assumption. So it's, uh, um, uh, it's the other assumption that we have to make for computational purposes. So it turns out that this much more general uh, utility function can be uh, elicited if we just have two observations rather than one. Uh, and, and I will show how in a moment, of course, under the assumption that the buyer is using, is consistently using the same utility function and he's always exhausting his budget and, um, uh, in, every, uh, in every demand uh, vector. How much time do I have? 20 more minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, I'll finish much, much, much earlier than that. Um, okay, so, so how do we... Um, I was surprised. Five more minutes. Yeah. Ah, that's a big difference. <laughs> Five minutes. Okay, that's. Um, yeah, let's start to negotiate on that. Some let's take the, somewhere in between. Okay, so uh, how do we elicit a constant elasticity of substitution function? Uh, we um, um, our input here is a demand vector Q1 through QM at some prices pi. And uh, we know that we assume that the advertiser is a utility maximizer. He's maximizing his utility under current prices. So we can take first order condition, and it's well known that it leads to this condition that is called tangency condition uh, for any pair of goods. We, um, so we instantiate this equation for, uh, for good one and good two, and then for good two and good three, and so on. So what we're getting here are m minus one equations with m unknowns, because the betas here are, are, are unknowns, and for, for a second we are assuming that we know rho. Let's, let's assume for a second that, that we know the elasticity of substitution, this constant, um, and, but we also know that the sum of the, of the uh, and I think it's not mentioned in the previous slide, but the sum of those coefficients, uh, because they are weights, uh, is, is equal to one, so we have m equations with m unknowns and we can solve it. In fact, we don't really have to solve m equations with m unknowns. We, we can just, uh, because of this form of equations, we can just start with some uh, any b1 and, uh, and then get the rest of the b's from that and then normalize it uh, such that they sum up, uh, sum up to one. Um, and now, but the problem is that we don't know rho, so we need this second observation that I mentioned. So now we have another, uh, another demand vector over some other prices, pi prime. Uh, and pi prime has to be different from pi in at least one coordinate where the, uh, uh, where the, where the utility is not zero. So we can now divide one equation by the other uh, uh, near that coordinate and, uh, and extract rho out of it. Um, so this tells us that theoretically, at least, we can, with two observation, extract this uh, constant elasticity of substitution function. Um, what, in practice, will probably be more useful to do is to, because advertiser will not really use the same utility function uh, with the same elasticity uh, consistently uh, in every purchase, then we will have to, um, uh, then it will probably be better to take many observations and find the best fit for row using linear programming. Um, so this 
this closes this part on on utility and one more thing here it also tell uh, with the with this structure it is also polynomial to uh, to find the uh, the utility maximizing demand vector that this is something that we need to do during um, when we use the demand oracle uh, because it is we are it is just the same the difference is that here the betas were the unknowns and when we do utility utility uh, maximization we already know assume that we know the utility functions which are the betas and and uh, and and, uh, and rho the unknowns are the queues because we need to find the utility maximizing demand vector so again we do the same thing we instantiate a key, uh, one queue and instantiate the rest of them and then normalize it according to the budget constraint okay so uh, what's left to talk about is this is the supply this is the last slide um, how do we generate this explicit disjoint representation of supply and what 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 it needs to look like is something like that because we want to know that we have 150,000 impressions of low income uh, people from Michigan and then we might have in addition 20,000 impressions of cyclists with high income from Michigan but then we might also have 200,000 impressions of me of uh, of people from Michigan that we don't know anything else about. We don't know whether they are cyclists or uh, whether they have high or low income. Um, and all these numbers are disjoint, so the sum of all the impressions is the sum of all the numbers in the leaves. And this really uh, looks like a decision tree, and because we need to, uh, to get it, to obtain it from, from, uh, from, from publishers' log files, it seems natural that we will use decision tree algorithm, but for that we need some kind of we 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 need some decision or in other words we need a target attribute and actually there is a very natural target attribute here which is the price of each impression because we know that there is no reason for a supplier to distinguish or to commit to attributes if it does not mean that it will increase the price that he gets for uh, for those for uh, for those impressions so what we can do is take the log files, which we assume are just entries of impressions that the, that the supplier uh, uh, viewed or uh, had, uh, with each one has all the attributes that the supplier uh, recorded for that, uh, that the publisher recorded for that, uh, for that visit, for that impression. And we just label them with expected price of that type of impression. The expected price can come from many sources. It can come from the current market prices. It can come from the spot market. Uh, or, or we might also want to do some exploration in there, but I will not get into it. Um, and then using a decision tree algorithm, or more accurately, because it's a continuous target attribute, it's a regression tree algorithm. It will give us um, it will it will give us a price. Uh, sorry, it will give us the most compact tree that uh, that that we want to use for this uh, for this uh, publisher. So um, to summarize, uh, what we proposed is a posted prices market for clearing the ad contract. Uh, it's a posted prices for clearing the ad contract market. Uh, for the market, we have a compact price structure. Uh, we, and, and the way to bridge these different languages that, that advertisers and uh, publishers are using, uh, we show the existence of equilibrium and that we can calculate it in polynomial time. And um, on the demand side, we assume a relatively expressive form of utility function, which is the constant elasticity of substitution with gross substitutes. And we show that we can elicit this kind of utility function just by observing the uh, purchases of advertisers. And uh, on the supply side, we take the log files and turn them into market goods. If I have another, do, do, I, do I have a minute or I'm done? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just one word. What I kind of put aside is how this market works, the, the dynamics of this market, because we, uh, we do have a problem here. The, um, when we observe the advertiser's behavior and, and deduct a utility function from that, they are already, they are, they are already doing a purchase. So uh, if, they, if the current prices are not reflecting this demand well, then we're then we're not really going to have supply equals equals demand. So we have two options here. Either we make it less continuous and more periodic. So we say we clear the market once a week, and we are during the week we are just getting orders and not and not guaranteeing anything, and then calculating equilibrium prices 
based on the utility that we observed, and then we give advertisers a take it or leave it offer based on the, the utility function that we assessed for them, so they are expected to take it. Um, and um, so, th so this is pretty solid theoretically. Uh, what we, if we are more adventurous, then we can assume that the, uh, that the demand doesn't change much, so, so we can set, uh, so we can take a set of prices and uh, uh, based on what we observed so far and just uh, have this uh, approximate equilibrium all the time and update the price each time that we see that it's got too, too far from the, uh, that, the, that the supply and demand are, uh, are different than what we had in mind before than what we have observed before. Okay, so I'm, now I'm done.